Next, let's talk about maps and map scale. So maps, uh, these are tools that describe where things are. Uh, we use them for nav navigating our world and also primarily for understanding. Now, early on, navigation was a big deal and we don't really need them for navigation as so much anymore, but we use them as a tool for describing where things are and understanding the spatial relationships between places. And, and I'll get into more detail later on this, but also measuring those relationships, especially in the age of computers, that we don't just look at maps, but we analyze maps. Now, one of the key concepts when it comes to maps is the concept of scale. And scale has to do with the ratio of distance on the map to distance on the ground. And one way to think about this is, say, Google Maps. If you um, are zoomed in or zoomed out, to Google Maps, you, what you're doing in effect is you're changing the scale. When you're zoomed in, the ratio of distance on the ground to distance on the map is different than when you're zoomed out. And there's trade-offs in this approach. So this is a map of the Western US, and you can see where San Francisco is in relation to Salt Lake City, um, but you, don't, you couldn't use this to navigate around San Francisco. It's not the right scale. Whereas over here, when you're zoomed in, you're, you're able to see and navigate around. And so just to reiterate this, it's the ratio of distance. And, and oftentimes maps will have a number like this, or usually they use a scale bar. That's kind of more intuitive. But what these numbers mean is that the ratio is one to one million. That means that one inch on the map it is equivalent of a million inches in reality or on the ground. And that's different from this map on the right where one inch on the map, on the map here is the equivalent of 10,000 inches. So it's at a different scale. Uh, second thing about maps is they, they can be projected in different ways. So I'll include a video that's kind of nice and illustrative of this, but essentially you, you what you're doing with a projection is you're taking the round earth and you're applying it to a flat surface. And there's no perfect way to do this. Um, any way is gonna be messy in some way or the other. You're either gonna distort the size, shape, direction, or distance. And some of these um, work better when you're zoomed in, some don't, but there's a whole lot of different ways that we can project maps onto a flat surface. And just to illustrate the trade-offs, I'll kind of um, talk about two. So we can talk about equivalent versus conformal. And equivalent is a type of map that the, sh the areas are correct. We also call these an equal area map. So here, Greenland is the right amount of area, but its shape is not correct. So it preserved area, but distorted the shape. And on the right is a conformal map. And here, Greenland is the right shape, but it is the wrong size. It's showing it, this is what they call the Greenland problem, where a map like this shows Greenland is exaggerated to the point that it looks like it's as big as South America, which in reality it's not. It's much tinier than that. So we have equivalent on one extreme and conformal on the other. Um, for practical purposes, we often use what's called a compromise projection. These sort of balance those two out. They're not equivalent or conformal, but they're a, kind of some reasonable compromise within, between the two. We can also look at types of maps that, you know, depending on the purpose that you're using them for, there are reference or general maps. These really are about navigating and telling you where you're at. So Google Maps is a good example of that. Google Maps is really about getting around your world and understanding just where things are in general. And the second type is called thematic maps. And these convey data like population or wealth or vegetation or whatever it is that you're studying. Let me just kind of give a couple examples. Uh, this, this is a reference map of Europe. And one thing I'll highlight is that Portugal is in green and Spain is in yellow. And that's not really significant. They are colored only to kind of illustrate those boundaries. Whereas in this thematic map, you have 
uh, the colors are coded to the economic wealth of the country. And so here, the United States is in green and Mexico is in yellow. And here that's significant because that's kind of tied to some kind of uh, classification system for the country. And there's different types of thematic maps, as we call the coral pleth, which uses color coding. Uh, here's a second example called it is, is a rhythmic that uses uh, different levels of shading. In this instance, to show you where there's uh, different levels of population density. Uh, one thing I'll highlight is that there are dense populations of people in India and China, which are two of the largest, the two largest countries in the world. You can see that through the shading here. A lot of people packed in there. And just to kind of go back a step, that this is really kind of a hierarchy. And I'll use a contour map as an example. A contour map is a map that has lines of equal elevation. And you can kind of imagine that's a little volcano there, that's a volcano. And you can kind of see the 3D, um, you can kind of imagine this in three dimensions because of seeing these lines of equal elevation. Now, so we have general maps and we have thematic maps. Thematic maps, again, convey data. They can convey data in different ways. So Coropleth uses coloring, and is, is rhythmic uses shading, and we have something called an isoline map that uses lines of equal value. And among the isoline map, there's different subtypes. There are isotherm maps that have lines of equal temperature, isobar maps that have lines of equal air pressure, and like our example here, we have a contour map with lines of equal elevation. All right, so maps have themes and in, with the computerized environment, we can really unlock our potential to, to put more than one uh, theme together at a time, to put multiple themes of information, be able to study and use those at once. And that gets us into the realm of what's called GIS, or Geographic Information Systems. And what these do is they integrate digital map, and they integrate map information in a digital environment to database records. And so you have the, the visual capability of maps tied to the, the, the power of databases for analysis. And the way these work is that they store map information as layers of information. So you might have layers with land cover and boundaries, transportation and so on. And you have both map features, things that elements that are on the map itself, but also you have what are called attributes. You have database records that are tied to the elements on these maps. So these are not just pictures of maps. These are digital, um, these are really just sort of digital objects that have both properties of maps and also database records. And that gives you a lot more power of analysis. And I'll include some additional information, but I just want to illustrate that here's just a couple of examples. Here is maybe this would be a GIS for looking at a park. You have a land ownership, forest cover, soils, and so on. And on the right, this may be an example of looking to where to open a business. You have population, stores, land use, so GIS is important, not only in physical geography, but also in economic or human geography as well. 